Good morning. Welcome, everyone. It's a, it's a joy, it's a privilege to uh, host so many. Um, it is a special day for Barry and Priscilla, and uh, it's an honor to have your friends and uh, relatives here with us to uh, witness this uh, special day. This morning for uh, devotions, we had about the uh, Holy Spirit and how it was poured out on the, the apostles, and I thought it was just a, a very appropriate uh, devotional for, for a, a special event as we have today about the baptism and uh, desiring that the Holy Spirit could be poured out and uh, could be especially upon Barry and Priscilla and, and also upon everyone. Thank you for the songs and the uh, Sunday School discussions. So as I said, uh, we're uh, planning a baptism and uh, we'll, we'll go ahead with that right away. And then after that, it'll be followed by a message. So I would ask uh, Barry and Priscilla if you wanted to come up, we'll do it on this side now. And uh, I've had the privilege of uh, meeting Barry and Priscilla uh, a few times, and I've been uh, blessed, uh, appreciated the testimony that they had, uh, their desire to be baptized, to uh, be part of the Church of Christ, and uh, to give their, give their lives, give their all for the Lord. So just like to uh, give them an opportunity to share what you have in your heart. Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. That is my desire and prayer, that God would search me and know me, and that he would lead me where he wants me, and that I would give up my all... And and follow where he leads. Though it's not always easy, I know it will be worth it. Giving up my own will is not always easy, but I like Psalm 37, verse 5. Commit the way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. If I surrender, God will mold my life into what he wants it to be. My desire is to be completely surrendered to God's will for me as I continue serving him. Thank you. Appreciate it. You being bold and, uh, and willing to share that in front of the audience. Then we'll uh, go over to the questions. I have uh, five questions that I'll be asking. So the first question is, do you believe in one true, eternal, and almighty God who is the creator and preserver of all things visible and invisible? I do. I do. Next question, do you believe in Jesus Christ as the only begotten Son of God, that he is the only Savior of mankind, that he died upon the cross and gave himself a ransom for our sins, so that through him we might have eternal life? I do. I do. Do you believe in the Holy Ghost who proceeds from the Father and the Son, that he is the comforter who abides in and sanctifies the hearts of believers and leads them into all truth. I do. I do. Are you truly sorry for, are your, for all your sins past? Sorry, I'll try that again. Are you truly sorry for all your past sins, and are you willing to renounce Satan, the world, all the works of darkness, and your own carnal will and sinful desires? I am. Do you promise by the grace of God and the aid of his Holy Spirit to submit yourself to Christ and his word and faithfully, and faithfully to abide in the same until death? I do. I do. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> so they have publicly uh, confessed their desire and uh, their commitment and upon that public confession, that commitment before God and before you all, 
I trust we can proceed with the baptism. And with that, I would ask if you wanted to kneel and then we'll proceed with that. have made before God and these witnesses, I baptize you with water in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Upon the confession of your faith, which you have made before God and these witnesses, I baptize you with water in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Paul talks about in uh, Romans 6 verse 4, he writes how by baptism we're, uh, we're buried with Christ so that as uh, Christ was risen from the dead, so we can uh, rise in the newness of life and, and walk in it. You may be seated. Thank you. So, as long as, as you're faithful and abide in the doctrine of his word, you are his disciples. And you are acknowledged as members in the body of Christ. So, uh, Barry and Priscilla, they've also requested membership here at the local church body, Bethel Mennonite Church. And so I'd put the question to the congregation, and I'd, I'd include uh, everyone that's here visiting or uh, members here at home. If uh, you want to support Barry and Priscilla's membership here at Bethel Mennonite Church, I ask that uh, you would stand up and show your report, uh, support with that. Thank you. You may be seated. All right. Thank you again. May God's name be glorified through it. For the message, uh, I'd like us to turn to Matthew chapter 12. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 12, starting verse 22. I'll uh, read the portion first and then we'll uh, go over it verse by verse. By verse. Matthew 12, verse 22, Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Or else, how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house? He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him, but whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world nor in the world to come. Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. 
O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, bringeth forth good things. An evil, and an evil man, out of the evil treasure, bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. So back to verse uh, 22. I'll, uh, I'll reread it in a different uh, translation. So verse 22, Then a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute was brought to him, and Jesus healed him, so that the man, so that the man who was blind and mute could speak and see. So this person was brought to Jesus being possessed with a devil, and he was blind, and he was mute. That is a very sad state to be in. It is possible that the demon or the devil caused this blindness and this muteness that he couldn't speak uh, as a, uh, a way of trying to keep this person under control, that he would not uh, see, that he would not uh, confess Jesus Christ. So Jesus healed the person on all three ways. In other words, we could say three miracles happened here. The devil or demon was cast out. He could now see and he could speak. So Jesus has power over all demons. He has power over all diseases. Verse 23, and all the crowds were amazed and said, can this be the son of David? It was remarkable what had happened. The crowd was amazed. They couldn't deny it. Something amazing had happened. Might this be the son of David or the Messiah, we could say? No doubt, something amazing had happened and something good had happened here. Verse 24, but when the Pharisees heard this, they said, it is only by Beelzebul, the ruler of demons, that this man casts out demons. Oh, it's only by uh, the ruler of demons, by Beelzebul, that he does all this. Beelzebul was another name for Satan. So these Pharisees, they had a problem. They did not accept Jesus as the Son of God. But the miracles were remarkable. They, they showed that there was power, that there was something. So they needed an explanation. But they did not want to admit that they were wrong. They wanted Jesus put down and themselves protected. Their own uh, positions protect, protected. Basically, they said, it's a conspiracy. On the surface, he appears to be doing good. He appears to be casting out demons. He appears to be a very good person. But at the bottom of it, it is all driven by Satan. It is all for, by Satan's power that he does it. They were caught up in defending themselves and too proud to admit that they were wrong. Instead of surrendering and submitting to Christ, they came up with their own uh, defensive ideas to, to uh, explain and, and defend themselves. Do we ever follow a similar pattern? Can you and I admit and confess when we are wrong? Or do we just try to gather ideas that support our opinions, that put us up there and, and put others down? The claim was very serious. In this case, they were accusing a, a, a holy man, a, a sinless man, a son of God, as being led by Satan himself in order to protect their own uh, self-importance. How often do we hear or see examples of people speaking evil of others and running others down in an attempt to exalt their own opinions or their own perspectives? When we hear anyone speaking evil of someone else, we should be careful what we believe. Very often when someone speaks evil of someone else, it is to exalt himself and to downplay the other, to downplay any evidence that might prove them wrong. Verse 25, knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste and no city or house divided against itself will stand. Verse 26, so if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? Here's another miracle. 
Jesus knew their thoughts. That was a miracle as well, something that we cannot do. That alone could have convinced the Pharisees that he was the Son of God. But once they were on the track of, of uh, defending their own beliefs, it, it became harder and harder to admit that they were wrong. Just like Pharaoh in Egypt just seemed to dig in his heels further and further as, as he was challenged and as, as the wonders proved against him. In uh, Luke chapter 16, there's the rich man. Uh, he wanted uh, Lazarus to be raised from the dead to send back to his brothers to warn them because he did not want his brothers to come to the same place where he was. And then uh, Abraham says, if, they reject, if they're rejecting Moses and the prophets, then if a, if a great miracle like this would happen, it would just harden their hearts further because they were already on this track of, of uh, uh, rejecting Moses and the prophets. If something bigger would happen, it, it would cause them to just dig their heels in deeper and deeper and to uh, defend their own ways. It is important that we have a teachable spirit and a humble heart, willing to admit when we are in the wrong. So demons, they do not leave voluntarily. They only leave their prey if they are forced to do so or if they see that they can, uh, can get greater gain by uh, leaving one person and entering uh, more others, whatever. So they do not just voluntarily leave a person. If Satan cast out his own demons, it means there is division. It means he's working against himself, one part working against the other. There is a uh, commonly used statement. It says, united we stand, divided we fall. can be applied in, in many ways. We know that in our bodies, if, if one part of our body works against the other part of our body, the results are disastrous. It, it's very disastrous for a body if it, if it doesn't function well together. How do we relate to other members in the body of Christ, and more particularly members of the local church body we are part of? Are we tearing up our own body or are we building and supporting it? Verse 27, and if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your followers cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. King James said, uh, children here, I believe uh, the translation followers is a little more accurate the way we use it. So these uh, children or followers, they were uh, Jewish people who seem to be able to cast out some demons. And uh, from what I've read, it, it seems they, they used special prayers that they claimed were passed on from Solomon. So they were passed on, and they were using those prayers, and it, it seemed to be successful. They could, they could drive out demons with those prayers. And these followers they would certainly say that, that they did it by the power of God, the Creator. They, they could not do it they, with uh, Satan's power. They were using it with God's power. So the Pharisees, they showed their inconsistency by approving the practice if it was their followers, but not if it was Jesus. If it was through Jesus, then it was from Satan. But if it was their followers, then it was uh, from God. So their own followers would agree that Satan could not cast out Satan. So clearly, it was, it was jealousy that drove the Pharisees to this conclusion. Verse 28, But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. As is obvious, Satan does not cast out himself. But if Jesus was casting out demons by the Spirit of God, then obviously the kingdom of God had come very near. Never in human history had so many miracles been done by one man. Truth was truth. They could accept Jesus as a son of God and embrace the kingdom of God, or they could keep on fighting against it in vain. Verse 29. Or how can anyone enter the house of a strong man and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then he will plunder his house. 
Jesus was not casting out demons by Satan, but actually working against Satan. He refers to Satan here as a strong man. In another uh, reference, Jesus refers to him as the, the ruler of this world, the prince of this world. So Satan had gained his strength when Adam and Eve believed his lie and disobeyed God. So Satan's strength relies on people believing his lies. Because sin separates us from God, and we are descendants of Adam and Eve, where sin entered the world, every human was Satan's gain. Every human, we could say, was Satan's goods that he was storing up in his house because we were all lost. We were all born in sin. So the only, the only way for someone to, to spoil Satan's house, to plunder his goods, to, to free all the captives that, that Satan had in his house, is for someone stronger than Satan to bind him and then... Uh, plunder his house and uh, redeem his goods and that is who Jesus is Jesus says he's not only stronger than Satan but he is strong enough to defeat him to bind him and to free everyone who believes in Christ everyone who is who is bound by Satan who was who was put in his uh, in his house in his storehouse as his goods Jesus has the power to defeat him to bind him and to free everyone that believes in Jesus Christ. That is exactly the opposite of using Satan's power to cast out demons. He was working exactly against Satan. When Jesus sent out the uh, 70, he sent them to the uh, surrounding uh, villages and towns. They returned with joy stating that even the demons were subject to them through the name of Jesus. So Jesus began binding the strong man, Satan, when he started his ministry, and he, he completed that work when he died on the cross, descended to the lower parts of the earth, and ascended, leading captivity captive and giving gifts to men. As Ephesians 4, verse 8 and 9 says, uh, that those that were taken captive by Satan, he, was, he went down there and uh, took captive, uh, uh, captivity captive, took them and gave gifts to man that we can uh, still anticipate. So Satan is still powerfully waging wars against us until judgment day. But with Christ, we have someone much stronger, someone who, who is not only stronger than Satan, but who can defeat him, who, who has already defeated him, and who can bind him and redeem everyone that Satan has has uh, put under his uh, rule, we could say. If we put on the whole armor of God, Ephesians 6, verse 11 and 12 talks about it, and we walk faithfully with Jesus, then we will prevail. We have that promise, that hope. Verse 30, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. So there is no middle ground. We either work for Christ or we work against Christ. This referred especially to the Pharisees who tried to find middle ground in their hypocrisy. Uh, they, did not, uh, want, they did not believe Christ. They did not want uh, to honor him. And yet they, they feared the people who, who did believe. But Jesus makes it very clear that if they do not work with him, they work against him. This is true today as well. You are either working for Christ or against Christ. There is no middle ground. You are either building the church or you are tearing down the church. Are you a stepping stone for someone or a stumbling block for someone? Verse 31 and 32. Therefore, I tell you, people will be forgiven of every sin and blasphemy, but they will not be forgiven for the blasphemy against the Spirit. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, neither in the present age nor in the age to come. 
So the Pharisees, they were very strict in what they called sin or blasphemy. They wouldn't eat with, with sinners. Uh, they wouldn't eat with blasphemers. Uh, those were people to be judged according to the law, to be stoned, to be uh, done whatever the law said should be done to them. But Jesus says, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. Many of those things that the Pharisees would automatically uh, condemn by the law would be forgiven. So it was, it was opening the gate to a lot more forgiveness than what the Pharisees allowed. Even, it says, even speaking against the Son of Man or speaking against Jesus Christ, there could be forgiveness for it. But Jesus sternly warns the Pharisees that blaspheming against the Holy Spirit was serious. Many people were uh, ignorant of Jesus. They considered him only to be a human, the, the carpenter, Joseph's son, and, and so on. Uh, they, they were ignorant of who he was. <clears throat> this ignorance is forgivable. A soul in his ignorance, he spoke against Christ. He, he boldly killed Christians thinking that he was doing God a favor. That was forgivable because he repented and believed. The Pharisees clearly saw the Holy Spirit working and doing miracles through Jesus Christ. The evidence was obvious that Jesus had power over demons, over blindness, over uh, muteness, and many more miracles that, that they'd already witnessed from Christ. But instead of praising God and giving him glory for what he was doing through, through Jesus, despite their differences, they did the opposite and claimed that Jesus was doing this by the power of Satan. Again, they, they chose to protect their own position and ascribe everything else to Satan that didn't agree with them. How can the Holy Spirit convict a person who claims that that voice comes from Satan? That is a very serious state, and Jesus has sobering words for such a person. But let us be careful that we do not withhold forgiveness for someone that Christ would gladly forgive. Satan has, has used these verses many times to make people feel uh, hopeless, uh, to, to make them pre to uh, tell them that, that they, can, they can never be forgiven. We, maybe we blaspheme the Holy Spirit and, and so on. There's, there's people that, that suffer under such uh, temptations. Uh, if, if someone has a concern about his forgiveness, to me that is a sign that the Holy Spirit is already uh, working in that person's life, is already prompting him to make changes. The Pharisees, in this case, they were not worried about their forgiveness. They saw no need to be forgiven. They, they felt they were, they were righteous. Uh, they were too focused on justifying themselves and condemning Christ. They were not worried about whether they'd be forgiven or not. So if that thought comes to you, allow the Holy Spirit to uh, work in your heart. Verse 33, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for by its fruit the tree is known. Again, Jesus was uh, speaking to the Pharisees. A good tree brings forth good fruit, good fruit, and a bad tree brings forth bad fruit. If the fruit that came out of Jesus was good, in this case it was uh, healing a demon-possessed, blind, and mute person, then it was obvious that the tree was good. This does not mean that we are... are uh, predestined to always either bear good or bad fruit. A tree can be changed. And uh, uh, farmers will know that. We have uh, fruit farmers here. Uh, a, a good tree can be grafted into a bad tree. Or if a uh, good tree is neglected, it is not pruned, uh, we know that there's a chance that, that shoots can, can overtake the tree and without care, it, it becomes a, a useless tree. It becomes a bad tree. 
So Christ can change us for good, but the truth still is our fruit will reflect what kind of tree we are. Verse 34, you brood of vipers, how can you speak good things when you are evil? Or for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Jesus knew the hearts of the Pharisees. He was not throwing insults at the Pharisees. In fact, Jesus knew much better what was in their hearts than they knew themselves. It was natural for the Pharisees to, uh, to speak evil of Jesus because that was what was in their heart. What is coming out of your heart? Jesus says, the mouth speaks out of the abundance of the heart. The words you speak are like the fruit of your heart and it reveals what kind of tree your heart is. If you think of the words you have spoken, what does it indicate about your heart? Is it good fruit? Is your heart a good tree? Verse 35, the good person brings good things out of his good, tre out of his good treasure, and the evil person brings evil things out of his evil treasure. So he talked about uh, the abundance of the heart. Uh, now he talks of treasures. So we could say there is an abundance or a storehouse of treasures in the heart. They can be good treasures or they can be uh, bad treasures. What is stored in your heart? What you've said in the last days, in the last weeks, months, years, have come from the storehouses in your heart. Have those words been true, honest, just, pure, lovely? We heard that uh, verse already, Philippians 4 verse 8. Have they reflected that? Verse 36, but I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every idle word they speak. Most people expect we'll give an account for every evil word we speak. But Jesus says, we are accountable for every idle word we speak. Again, there is no middle ground. We either build with the words we speak or we tear down. One dictionary uh, defines idle words as empty rhetoric or insincere or exaggerated talk. I was thinking of uh, one verse, Ephesians 4 verse 29, it says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Are the words you speak edifying? Do they minister grace unto the hearers? So we take uh, Ephesians 4 verse 29 as as a uh, description or as a definition for uh, idle words, we could say, uh, we would say idle words are any words that do not edify. That doesn't mean that, that we always just talk about spiritual things, but it means whatever we talk about, we talk about it in such a way that we can edify one another, that we can uh, uh, build one another up, and that we can speak for the glory of God. Verse 37, for by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Naturally, we are concerned what others speak about us. When we hear our name mentioned, there's another circle talking, and we hear they're talking about me, or I hear that at that meeting or, or at that gathering, they were talking about me. What were they talking about me? It, it, naturally, we are concerned what others talk about us. If it was something good that they spoke about us, it makes me feel good. 
But if someone spoke evil about me, it makes, makes me feel bad. That's our natural feelings. That we're, that's what we're naturally concerned about. And we could expand on that. If someone speaks good of us, we are tempted to, be, uh, to get puffed up, to become uh, proud, to become self-righteous. Oh yeah, they said all this good about me. On the other hand, if uh, someone speaks evil of me, we're tempted to respond with uh, bitterness and anger and thinking evil of those uh, people as well or, or, or trying to uh, defend myself and so on. But Jesus says, that's not how it truly is. God does not judge us by what others say of us. You will be justified or condemned based on your own words. What others speak about you makes no difference on who you are, on who you really are. But the words you speak reveal what is in your heart. And that is the fairest judgment. If my justification depended on what you speak of me, you could all agree to, to uh, condemn me, or you could all agree to justify me, and I could do nothing to it. I'd have, have no choice. I, I, would be, I would be destined to whatever you agree about me. But now it says, it is my words out of my heart that condemn me or justify me, and your words out of your heart either condemn or justify you. A question with that, can we sometimes speak from the head while being disconnected from the heart? And I'll have two examples here. Uh, one example, I've witnessed this, uh, that someone can take a call from an unhappy customer and be very understanding, very polite on the phone, but once the call has ended, the line is disconnected, that same person can vent his frustrations in a very unkind, very impolite way. When was he speaking from the heart? Was it while he was on the phone or was it afterward? Another example, maybe more common, uh, when we meet a customer or someone in town and he asks, how are you? Oh, I'm doing great. It's a wonderful day. Nothing to complain. It's beautiful. But inside, we have far more things to complain about than to be thankful about. We speak good things because we know in our heads that we need to be nice to other people so they will be nice to us. Are we speaking from the heart? What do we say when we are alone or when we are with someone that we're not ashamed to say everything we wanted to say? If all the words you can remember that you have spoken were recorded and kept for Judgment Day, then they'd be play, played back and you'd be judged by what you have spoken. Would you be okay with that? Are there words that you would want deleted from that recording? We cannot take back words that we've said, but we can repent of words that we've said. We can ask for forgiveness. If we have a truly repentant heart, we will also want to make sure that the person to whom we said it also knows that we are sorry for the words that we've said. And I'd encourage, let us not be ashamed to be specific about what we are sorry about. Sometimes we can uh, overgeneralize the confession that uh, we're sorry for some words that we said uh, way back uh, during COVID or during that meeting or whatever. Uh, apologizing, but being very, very general with what we're sorry about. How will the other person know what we're truly sorry about? So let us properly deal with our words so that they will not come back later and condemn us. Jesus says in uh, Luke 21, verse 33, he says, uh, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Jesus 
will never repent of the words that he has said. The words he has said, they will never pass away. They will always be there. They are uh, they're true, they're holy, they're, they're words of life, they're life-giving words. They will always remain. What about our words? If we do not repent, if we don't have a repentant heart, our evil words will remain and they will condemn us. But if we repent and believe on Jesus Christ, the words of Christ will be there for us, for our good. They will be there. They will not pass away. As uh, 1 John 1 verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Those words remain. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I ask to bow for prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come before you. We praise your name. We thank you for your words. We thank you that your words will remain. Your words are life. Your words are truth. And Father, help us to repent, to uh, see things that we need to repent of, that uh, words that will condemn us later. Lord, that we could have a repentant heart, that your truth, your words that will remain forever could be our salvation. I thank you for each one that's here. I pray for your blessing upon each one. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.